And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple. We have two, we have not one, but two entries coming to us all, coming to us all the way from from the development team of Shin, of Shin Tiara Crusade of Time on what on one hand we ha we have co we have um co we have co-designer the one the one and only Danielle Fusetto and in, and on the and on the other hand we have one, we have one of the gentlemen hel helping with the in English end of the equation the one and only Joe Bloggs how are you two doing today Hello to everyone. Doing fine. Thanks, and thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. Hello there, and thanks for this opportunity. And I hope my English is, you know, is up to to the the challenge because I quite I, I speak English very 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 sh few times, and my English is is a bit rough. That joke, that one of joke, <laughs> which is very very good in English. <laughs> I'm not so good. <laughs> Let's say we just have different experiences in life, and that—that's yeah. the only thing. If it's any uh, if it's any consolation, this you are not my first rodeo when it comes to the language barrier. I know you, you interview some of my friends mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, some some times ago, so um, I I quite interesting in this interview as well. Thank mm -hmm. you a lot for having us. Yeah. And. So I'll start with the humble beginnings, as I often do with these. Now, so walk me through your respective first introductions to role-playing games, and what was it that made it um, stick? I go? Yeah, you first, Daniela. So I started uh, uh, playing tabletop uh, role-play game when I was 12. Mm -hmm. I started as a game master with uh, the third edition of Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, it was love at first sight. It was um, something that I really enjoyed in, in my early teens. Um, it was uh, quite important for me, the, 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 the exploration party, the world building. So uh, I, I went uh, on and on day and night, uh, building world and stories for my, my group. And then uh, about 2014, it became a sort of hobby and then uh, a job. Uh, I started with a, a small blog here in Italy. It's called the Story di Ruolo. Um, it's, it's broadly translated as role the uh, stories, role uh, tellings. And it was, you know, a bit of a... Um, uh, it was the, the thing that everyone was doing in, in 2014, 2015, open up a blog and, you know, start um, playing some new games. Uh, it was the time we, here in Italy, it was the time in which uh, Apocalypse World reached our community. So we, we are one, two years after American market. So when, when Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition reached uh, Italy in our own language it was three years after the English version so mm -hmm. we are a bit late from on the American market and English market mm -hmm. and uh, nowadays I I still enjoy a lot playing tabletop RPG I um, I started a, a, um, a format in 2016 it's called uh, GDR El Buyo in, in English it's like blind date with uh, tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, 15, uh, maybe 20 cities in Italy, which once a month or once a week people gather in a, in a pub or in a comics shop and mm -hmm. um, play with some, some master or some facilitator. But they don't know what they will be playing that night. So you, you go there and you don't know. Uh, which whom you will play and what you will play. This was 
very very important for for me and for a lot of people in Italy to explore new new type of tabletop RPGs. And apart from that, I I teach I teach narrative design at uh, um, Ive uh, and uh, which is a, a private university in Italy mm-hmm. about video games. And this is quite uh, important because it allows me to to remain in contact with my my teenage year and my tabletop uh, game uh, hobby, which is not more an hobby; it's, it's like more a job for me, mm-hmm. and it's quite uh, vital, important for me. So I'm I'm still that young uh, guy, that twelve year guy that uh, creates with words in in his mind. For me, it's it's like time has not passed. Yep. Okay, good. I believe that it's my turn to actually detail my origins. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would agree that I, I too, am still that sort of twelve or thirteen year old boy um, who sort of likes to play with words, um, words and settings. Um, my story, and I believe I can pinpoint it to a particular year, uh, begins in 1987 when I was in boarding school. Um, although Italian, I did go to school in England. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, obviously, the, the first year you're there with other boys and you say, okay, I have my, my school uh, schedule. But the second year, you get the hang of things and you say, okay, we have a little more spare time. And one of my friends said, hey, why don't we go to my room in the dormitory? um, And I have this wonderful game. And it was obviously the very first edition of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And from that was actually quite interesting. And then for some time, well, that got me occupied uh, for, I know, a couple of years. And then I sort of left that type of world. And I re-entered that world, I believe, in the early 90s, um, early to late 90s, with the games like, I don't know, Vampire Dark Ages, mm-hmm. um, or Changeling. Um, no, I that, haven't heard that um, one in a while. Um, oh, yes, exactly. That, that may uh, sort of tell what type of age I am. <laughs> um, away. Um, and so that was interesting. And then, obviously, with um, Dungeons and Dragons, with the third edition, second edition, three point five, whatever. And I can recall one interesting thing is that we tried to put it all together um, with some friends of mine here uh, in Milan, and we actually some of us came up with a campaign which mixed um, changeling, mage, and vampires as well. Um, it was quite strange, but, you know, as a one-off, um, not bad. Um, you know, when you're in that sort of age, when you're experimenting things at either late 20s, early 30s, and you say, okay, I don't want the usual stereotypes, and I want to create something which is newer, mm-hmm. which is, I believe, um, let's say, not wanting to spoil anything for, for the upcoming descriptions, um, what actually got us into this, and the the authors as well, you know, trying to find something new to do with it, with your time. Mm-hmm. Um, nowadays, talking about the the present, um, I, as a trade, I am a sort of English as a second language teacher um, here in here in Milan. Um, so for any sort of uh, let's say age bracket, I teach from teens to grown ups. <laughs> Um, to elderly people as well, and uh, that takes away most of my time, especially in the evenings, uh, when uh, friends like Daniela are normally going to be able to play, you know, put on terrace slippers perhaps from the home, at least in this particular time of the year, with the Rona, mm-hmm. and say, okay, let's enjoy an evening with friends, uh, gathering on the computer and just having a nice session of whatever game we can think of. Um, my only problem is that I normally teach on up until about sort of 11-ish, uh, and half past 10. And so that sort of cuts me out of that type of enjoyment. Mm. Say, but, you know, now and again, and obviously for the beta testing and whatever 
I did actually find some time to actually go out, even though just having a beer with friends and rolling a few dice. Yeah. Yeah, that sums it up. Now, the, now, um, that brings me to, to Shin, to Shintiara. And, um, else, there, this, this particular question on its origins is, a, is obviously a bit of, um, two, a bit of twofold, since the game design part is a, um, two, is a double-headed monster in, the, in the form of, um, Daniele and, um, Giovanni. And I'm cu I'm curious how how you met how you met up with um, Giovanni and how did the concept of Shintiara this um, this time traveling techno fantasy um, kind of come into being? Uh, so Shintiara is uh, um, a project with many authors. Uh, there are three main authors: Giovanni Pola, uh, Raul Farinon, which is the the main head behind the world and the world lore. Mm -hmm. and Marco Riccardi. They uh, had a first Kickstarter and a first tabletop RPG system in, I think, 2016-2017, which used the, 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 hundred, uh, the, the 100 dice. It's like a modern the 100 system. Mm -hmm. And I knew them in, uh, you know, in convention here in Italy. Uh, I am a big, huge fan of convention. I, I am a sort of convention animal uh, i i go to the convention i did I, I do a lot of session there about my own project my own tabletop rpgs uh you know it's uh, is the right place to form a sort of camaradism cam i don't know the, the english word mm -hmm. and you build up a sort of relation with uh, with people you know a lot of uh, italian authors uh, which is a uh, a small community, everyone know each other. So it's like you know, sometimes you 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 face uh, you you're talking with someone and you say, one day some some days not not uh, far from this day we will sit around the table and make a project together. And I talk with Giovanni last year uh, in the summer. And he came up with the idea to make a porting from the the, the old Shintiara system to the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, he knew the system very well. And he know, he knows the system very well. But you know, it's when, when you're facing a, a sort of big title, uh, a, a dragons mm -hmm. uh, if in, the, in the tabletop industry, you you, you always want to be sure. To, to make things um, to make things very clear and very uh, um, you know in, inside the, the inside the limits of, of fifth edition the, the main thing were, is also the the use of the um, of the OGL and, S, uh, and SRD of uh, fifth edition which is a bit of more a bureaucratic element so uh, deciding and establish what you can say, what you can say, the wording of the rules, and uh, etc. Et 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 so, last summer he, he talked to me, and I was like, you know, oh, it seems fun. It's, it's a very interesting idea. Mm -hmm. And when you you want to to do the sporting now, right? It's, it's, it was something like, you know, what about one in one or two day we we meet online and we talk about it. So it was kind of um, a fast, uh, a fast uh, uh, first part of the of the journey mm -hmm. from from summer 2020 to the Kickstarter, which launched on uh, the 15th of January. Um, there was already some some rules um, made out and written down, v very interesting and very very well defined. So. I was just, you know, the the, the guy that uh, the joined the team joins the team and keep the things moving on on the system. So the the, the very first interesting part of this uh, of this project is, is it is supporting. I underline this thing because it's not like you know building up things from from ground zero from from the start. It's you, you have to be very careful to adapt things. 
from the, the, the previous setting in a way that meets the fifth edition at the same time doesn't and it was a very interesting uh, very interesting job mm -hmm. and i was very pleased to to join the team and i also worked with giovanni and the other authors to uh, update also some part of the setting so the main difference between the first shintara and the, the second shintara is that in the first you was you was uh, it was more focused on you are in a fantasy setting, a certain fantasy world, um, more or less about uh, Renaissance era, with a lot of uh, strange and weird um, races, and uh, things uh, came from other ages. So there is a, a, a huge uh, continent with um, stuck in the mid in, in the Middle Age, late Middle Age, but at the same time. Through time port and trying to time warps, things from other ages comes in our own age. So um, th this is different from the the, the, the second Shikara, in which you travel through time. Uh, so the main the main um, addition to the fifth edition um, uh, the fifth edition game is you, you now have to time travel sometimes to resolve missions and, and quest and you know uh, get, get, get to the end of, of a session. In the first edition it was uh, a sort of mystery um, mystery type of game which you um, you try to res to solve some mystery on on the setting but without the time travel. So this is the main difference. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and uh, I can only agree. I believe the word you were looking for before was camaraderie. Um, <laughs> remembering that. Um, yes, I can only agree because I have, let's say, been on the team, um, let's say, since the beginning, um, going back to your original question, Mildred. I, uh, let's say, met Giovanni uh, the first night because he was a friend of a friend. Um, and so we began, so he said, oh, I have this uh, wonderful project, well, a project, um, and so I'd like you to, you know, to, to give me a hand and play it and see what you think about it, um, in Italian, obviously. Um, and so we got together a couple of evenings, uh, let's say a week, and played it, yes, um, exactly as uh, Daniele was saying, that the setting was not to downplay it, but, you know, with respect to this 5th edition setting, sort of a little more flat. This is more sort of three, well, four dimensional. Four yeah, exactly. Um, and that's the, the good thing about it. Um, obviously, the, the original setting does have its pros and its cons. That's why we you do these beta testing. You say, oh, no, wait a minute. This character is way too OP. This one doesn't really do much. How can we even it out? Um, and it's not only uh, a question of, you know, characters, races, trying to level them out, which is quite a tricky bit, you know, as with all these things. Um, I believe I personally played at least three of the races in uh, three different, um, uh, let's say, adventures. And obviously playing with the, the fifth, fifth edition one as well, a little bit trying to say, okay, shall we do it? And then, um, as we were talking about before, out of the blue, well, I was sort of half expecting it, um, Giovanni said, hey, you know, would you be able to give me a hand with a with this translation of it? And um, it sort of hits you because it is one thing I normally do um, as regular day job, sort of translating any sort of document. And I thought to myself, oh, I've never done something like this, you know, um, a role-playing game. And it's like, yeah, one of that, a hobby of mine. And so I said, even without thinking uh, about it, you know, two seconds, I said, done. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me here. Um, now, um, the only thing I have not done is play the, the fifth edition D&D. &D. And so the getting used to the rules, uh, even in Shintiara, reading them for the first time while translating them. And I said, okay, so it's done like that. And that's why um, Daniela's help has been really, really important. 
in keeping me up to date as well. Yeah. Now, obviously, one of the, one of the big things with um, Shin, with Shintiara is the is the use of not only time travel but um, temporal manipulation as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I'm cur I'm curious. Um, what was the inspiration for doing it in the in the style that it's presented with the with this particular setting? Because um, time travel is not new to ro to role playing games, even if it is a little bit on the niche end of things, for understandable reasons. Because if you'll per if you'll pardon my French for a minute, um, time travel is a fucking minefield, narratively speaking. <laughs> Where even oh, yeah. even stories that I like inevitably end up falling under their own uh, own weight when it comes to the paradoxes and contradictions that can prop up when dealing with it. Yeah. I'd say one of the rare exceptions was um, Primer, and that was a film that came out in 2004. So not, ex not exactly the best pickings. But I'm curious what was the reason you guys went with um, time travel as one of your one of your major themes. And how it can, and how you came to that conclusion? Um, so I, I can answer as uh, as for me because I I don't know what Giovanni was thinking when when we brought ten travel to the table, but I was thinking was that you know the, a sort of natural evolution from the first edition because in the first edition of Shintara you can you could you know, peek through the hole. You can see in other ages, but not travel at all uh, in other uh, in other ages. And this was like a sort of you know when you were you were playing, you you were saying, but I can travel through time. I can go inside the port and then uh, reach the the eighth uh, age and you know stick around a bit. And you, it's not you, you, you couldn't do it, but it, the, the game was not focused on, on it. So the player sometimes, I, I think, um, were a bit, you know, um, as I can say, um, not unhappy, but you were happy to with, with the old battle, the quest, and, and sorry. But when the, 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 the wonderful part, the time travel, get in, you were a bit stuck. Like, you know, you, you the mystery is solved, so you, you don't have to, to do the turn travel and and sometimes this is quite um, this can be quite a um, sort of uh, I don't know how to say in English um, a, a bit sad, you know, it's it, it's a wonderful session. You saw the mystery, you eat the dragon, the time dragon, the quantum dragon, you you save the day, mm -hmm. but at the same time there was that particular portal you could get in, but you you couldn't get in. So you are a sort of there is a sort of frustration in it. Can, can I do time travel for, for at least once? So for me it was like a natural a natural evolution. In, in this Shinkara, you can time travel. You you need to do time travel um, because some mission you, you, you cannot accomplish them in, in your own age. And at the same time, another natural evolution was the concept of crusade of time. So the new Shinkara had a sort of subtitle from the beginning, which was crusade of time. This this setting is more focused on the crusade mm -hmm. that the the struggle between the Cosmo and the Void. Mm -hmm. The Cosmo is the, the faction where that one Shinkara to, to leave and to to continue its, its own life, and the Void uh, instead wants Shinkara to to be devoured by Muria, which is um, a black hole. Uh, the, the story of, of Shinkara is quite simple. Uh, Shinkara um, orbits around two stars, 300 years before the the time that the player will will play uh, there was a, a sort of big uh, big event called the great dark and one of the two stars went um imploding and um be become um a black hole so shinkari is stuck on the event horizon between 
the the the, the star which is mm -hmm. already living and black hole. Mm -hmm. This create the crusade of time. So um, the faction which wants Shinkara to to resist and successfully uh, live through through the ages, and mm -hmm. that's the faction, the void that wants Shinkara to go in the, the black hole. So it was like you know a sort of network things for for the setting to go in the direction of time travel because the champions of the factions, the main gods of this of this setting, travel through time. So as um you know as a um a recruiter, as um as a recruit, sorry, as a part of the faction, you have small missions, small jobs, but. How can you do the job? How can you be part of the crusade of time without time traveling? So, it's it was it was so natural to for us to to add it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we we was we, we are still wondering some time um, about how to to write adventure in with, with a whole dimension. And we came up, Giovanni came up with uh, a lot of uh, singular and important ideas to, to uh, you know, to have the same feeling of a uh, time travel story like uh, Back in Time or like Dark, uh, like uh, Looper. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, without the, the, the edish of, of time travel paradoxes. So we have a, a, a sort of limitation in time travel. Um, you cannot time travel anywhere, anytime with your own power. You can manipulate time, but um, except for for high level characters, mm -hmm. I think uh, from eighteen eighteenth level to twenty level, uh, you cannot time travel on the spot. You need to find a veil, a portal, a sort of uh, you know, uh, sort of portal to to ages. And you cannot travel. Uh, um, um, you, you can only travel for twenty years or more. You cannot travel under twenty years. So uh, there is not the old part of you know. I go back in time. I meet my father. I kill my father, and then I, I was not born. Mm -hmm. No, because there, there are twenty years before um, that, that you cannot touch. So. This is uh, this is called quantum or uh, quanti in, in the setting, and it's um it's a sort of fate safe for for the chronicle for the the dungeon master, which we we call chronicle, um, and so the 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 more we get to you know explore how to time travel in fifth edition. The more we liked the the ideas that Giovanni and the other authors authors were were uh, you know developing. So at a one point was we cannot do Shinchara Crusade of Time without time travel. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite it's vital to the setting. It's, it's the the main the main reason I think Shinchara has reached what. This this great uh, uh, success on on the starter for mm -hmm. now. And I can uh, yes, um, sorry, Modra. Um, shift. Now the other the other um, particular column that I did want to address when it comes to Shintiara is the is the matter of it being a techno fantasy, and I I will admit. Um, when I looked at the visual representations of Shintiara, um, one of the th one of the old settings that I was immediately reminded of, for good or for ill, I'll leave that up to you, is Spelljammer, the most gonzo of of old school D and D settings. And I do have to wonder if that was what, if that was one of your influences when it came to doing this techno fantasy mm -hmm. and. If not, if not, what were some what were some of your um, influences when it came to establishing Shintiara's identity? Mm, I think that Spelljama was one of the inspiration for for Giovanni and the other authors because Spelljama for me is is a bit 
I'm younger than Spur Jammer. <laughs> I was playing years after Spur Jammer. Mm -hmm. I knew the setting. I, I, I never quite play the setting very well. So I, I did a, 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 you know, some one shot, some some single session with some masters here in Italy. But it was a kind of setting that was very weird and very rare here in Italy. So. I don't know if I played Spelljammer or the DM's version of Spelljammer translated from English to Italian by the DM. So mm -hmm. I don't know wh which, uh, where is the truth in, in what I played. Um, I'm more uh, a cyberpunk guy. I, mm -hmm. I'm very quite um, familiar with the genre of cyberpunk and also with um, the way the genre and so my my own inspiration was uh, um, all all the steampunk uh, um, settings which takes from uh, you know that that kind of of uh, pastiche to, mm -hmm. about the technology so it's not like a uh, a normal progression like the the, 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 the typical uh, steampunk which has uh, diesel punk uh, things or uh, vapor steam steam engines and whatsoever it's more like a pastiche mm -hmm. because technology here is from different ages so you have the very futuristic rifle or the the prehistorical weapon which is blessed by ancient and forbidden gods so mm -hmm. you need to 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 make a system and to make a, um, um, a visual reference which uh, can can help you visualize both both elements so mm -hmm. I was more into pastiche so um, I didn't I didn't have very particular reference for the tabletop RPG uh, I have had more visual reference, like a Pinterest, um, a Pinterest uh, a list of artwork, uh, a private uh, collection. You know, Pinterest is very useful to to have a sort of inspiration and so on. But mm. I think Spelljammer was totally when one of the of the of the inspiration for for this this work. Um, at the same time. Uh, I I speak Santa. I spoke with uh, with Giovanni, uh, and something that we wanted to Shinjaro to be was a bit different, a bit um, you know distinguish from uh, Numenera. Mm -hmm. We we didn't want people to to think that uh, Shinjaro was this sort of. Not clone, but you know, very similar to Numerera. It's, it's it's nothing like that. It's more mm -hmm. prestige because the time travel very um, the, ten, the the crusade of time itself um, break all break of the all the rules about the technology and about what you can see and what you can find. And at the same time, this technology, the all objects that are not from your own era. Are very powerful, but at the same time very dangerous. So, the pastiche element, the, the, the also the cyberpunk element, is more important here because I play quite a lot in cyberpunk, and I know that cyberpunk weapons are very useful, useful, mm -hmm. but at the same time, have a very high death rate. So, <laughs> that was quite. <laughs> That, that was what, what I was aiming for with the technological part. So, mm -hmm. very dangerous, very pastiche, very weird, very um, m more culture, more ages, uh, one upon the other. More stratified, uh, a more stratified uh, setting. Mm -hmm. Power always comes at a steep price. Yeah. And yeah. S speaking of power at a price. Let's talk about the paradox system. Um, with the fact that any re any recruit to the crusade can acquire um, energy in, in the form of paradox points and spend them to to utilize base temporal powers. Yeah. Um, but but accumulating 
accumulating too many um, too many paradoxes can lead can lead to certain consequences. And yep. what was that? Was that what? When it came to that system, was that one of the main ways that you guys wanted to express the whole idea that um, the these tremendous abilities with manipulation of time has a, a price? Yeah, the, the, the first thing for, of the paradox uh, system and the paradox point is that we want uh, uh, Shinkara to have loose you can bring to your own campaign. So. Uh, we were aiming for portability, and for this reason, if you if you want to take your character into a Shinchara campaign or some elements of Shinchara into your fifth edition campaign, we need some some system that was you know not not balanced but uh, compatible, uh, but uh, very very understandable and very. Um, uh, minimalistic in some way mm -hmm. so you have these paradox points and this is your energy and at the same time is the, the energy itself is a limit to you because on the on higher level if you have a lot of paradox points on yourself with your own uh, items and equipment because also your equi equipments can have paradox points uh, you can start to see the, the, the setting and, and the time crumbles uh, around you mm -hmm. and um, this is quite the reason um, uh, of of some elements of the setting it, it, it's like it's more coherent a lot of time the the champions the, of the factions uh, altered the history of Shinkara um, and at the higher level, you you could you can do this, but at the same time, you could also meet your hand very quickly. So you need to be careful when to use and when to spend your paradox point. Mm -hmm. This is true for all classes uh, for for the first edition. In addition, like many uh, elements of of the first edition, there are some classes and some new classes in. In Shinkara, which you know expands the, the limit and expands the power of time traveling and paradox point. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we, we, we didn't want these classes to be you know so powerful that the the, the, the rogue, the, the fighters, the paladin cannot cannot be at the same level. Uh -huh. um, we 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 didn't want people to choose. Uh, the, the Chrono Guardian over any other class because only the Chrono Guardian has Paradox Point. So uh, that's the limit. If you if you if you are a Chrono Guardian of high level of mid high level, you have a lot of power, but at the same time, respect spells or respect uh, you know fighters maneuvers. You need to be careful. It's a more strategic uh, class. Than, than other uh, of fifth edition, and at the same time, there are a lot of archetypes in Shinkara, one per class, mm -hmm. which allows you to um, to expand temporal powers without being a Chrono Guardian. So there is an archetype for the barbarian, for the bard, for the monk. Uh, each of those archetypes allows you to to have paradox point, mm -hmm. additional paradox points, and to have paradox. Uh, in temporal powers, but at the same time, as per the the Chrono Guardian, you need to be more careful to when you when you spend the uh, paradox points. So the, the the system limits itself, and and on the other hand, if you exceed and if time breaks, you're perfectly fine because it's the the main reason Shinkara existed is that time was broken. So if, if, if you exceed in your power and something bad happens, mm -hmm. it's perfectly fine with the fiction. Is what the, the um, sometimes is what happens in, 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 the, in the setting as well, in Chiara.
instead of defending Shintiara from a time, uh, time, temporal alteration, temporal manipulation. Yeah. Exactly, if I may add, it's the whole thing about breaking down the, the usual stereotype by good and evil. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, what is good and what is evil? Um, talking about uh, the, the Black Star Muria is sort of like a huge reset button. You know, nuke the world, and who knows, it may start over again. Instead, the other guys, um, and I say with the Cosmos, uh, they say, no, we don't want to nuke the world. We are the so-called good guys. Uh, but who says they're good? Perhaps, you know, the guys from, from Muria, from that faction, from the Void, they say, oh, no, there, there's way too many things which need to be cleansed in this world. And so that's why we need to start it over again, mm -hmm. because we can't do it any other way. And that sort of reminds me, as, as Daniela was saying, with the... Um, paradox points for everyone let's say in which everyone has a balanced type of system um sort of like where i remember when the second wind came out for D, &D and we said hey wait a minute everyone can heal themselves isn't that sort of defeating the purpose isn't that only for sort of cleric type of guys and we said oh no you know it's, it's a little more interesting <coughs> in the sense of you create a paradox, perhaps seeing it as something bad, you have to set it right. Or perhaps, is it right to set it right, or is it wrong? Mm -hmm. No. Yes. This ambiguity in, in the moral and the morality of your actions is another limit of the temporal power, because you, you may be of the Cosmo uh, faction, so you may be in the search of balance and you know, restoring the time uh, and etc. But at the same time, you you could uh, end an, 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 in a sort of an impasse. Maybe the only way to save the time is to break the time again. So spend a lot of paradox points to save someone, and at the same time, uh, alternate the timeline, which is against your own rules. So a lot of time, um, this this allows. Uh, player to have spectacular sh scene about uh, their own character and, and their own morality. Uh, you will you will spend a lot of paradox points, break the time, make a lot of problem, create new paradoxes. But at the same time, you, you will save someone, or you won't save someone. But at the same time, the, 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 the people will, will die. So it's it's a sort of you know, sometimes cos uh, the people from the Cosmo are seen as good, but sometimes they 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 will need to let some people die or let something bad happen in order to reset time. And at the same time, the Void sometimes will need to do, you know, something good, uh, saving someone, uh, but the, the, for, for a higher purpose, mm -hmm. break the time again. So th this is a sort of limit inside the limit itself. It's a fictional limit, of course, not mm -hmm. a mechanical one, but at the same time, it's 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 a very big limit. Yeah. Now, when it com now when it comes to when it comes to it, there are three there since the Chrono Guardian has been mentioned a couple of times. I do want to get into that with the new classes that are br that are brought in. Um, now. The quick start showed a little bit of the Chrono Guardian, specifically its first three um, levels, yeah. and it is ver it is very much a a um ca a casting class, although not although not a full size. I'd say I'd say it would probably qualify as a a um, half caster, but yeah, more a, more a three three quarter like uh, like a board, mm -hmm. more or less, but. What I'm cur what I'm curious about with the Chrono Guardian and with the other two classes that are going to be added with this setting, is what is what the, what particular thing they they add to the to the proverbial sandbox in terms hmm. of the in terms of their play styles. Uh, so the 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 three classes approach the the time the the. The, the theme of time travel and time 
in three different ways. Mm -hmm. The, the Crown Guardian is a more defender, so it's it's a bit inspired by the, the cleric and the paladin, and at the same time has a lot of tem temporal powers, which works more or less like the invocations of the warlock. So it's more focused on uh, you know protecting the timeline and foresee events. Um, the, the the main utility, if you if you are interested in a in a more sandbox uh, campaign or sandbox adventure, is that with the Crown Guardian you can you can use uh, all the powers that are, of course, uh, in the fifth edition. There are a lot of spell about it, uh, a lot of powers about asking the DM, asking the chronicler the chronicler something and have a right answer, a, a, an honest answer from 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 them, and um, so for for the sandbox part, the the strategy of the of the Chrono Guardian and the gameplay of the Chrono Guardian is more like you know a sort of augury type of character. You you foresee things. You mm -hmm. can also try to you know to. Um, it's more risky uh, in this way, but it's very, very, very fun. You can also try to to predict events and react before. Uh, so, uh, for example, you can stack a spell into time uh, because you think that uh, a certain people will pass in that specific um, point, and the spell will act, will uh, will be activated. So. so like a sort of temporal traps, more or less, and this is this is a gameplay that goes in in a direction in which you need to foresee events in order to protect uh, the timeline itself. So that is the Chrono Guardian. Mm -hmm. The Void Walker and the, the Dancer are have mm, totally different gameplay. The, the Void Walker is more like a destroyer of time. So. It's it it has not this as, as um it's not a spectacular class. Uh, this is the first thing. It's more like um a fighter class with temporal powers. So mm -hmm. you have a lot of um of powers about the strengthening your temporal damage, which is a type of damage which can be healed only during rest uh, and without any spell at all. Um, and the, the the type of gameplay is more like you know you enter a new timeline, you break things, and you, you do whatever you want to to go to, to reach your goal. Um, and you have a lot of paradox points more than the Chrono Guardian because you are an active player, you are an active agent of chaos, of mayhem. Um, so it's more like you know you 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 will. Uh, you will find yourself with the void worker sometimes define things in the sandbox. For example, you a uh, higher level of the of the void, void worker can, you know, like do something like a sort of intimidation through time. So you you re you rewrite a part of the story you you are um, you are seeing. You can go to an NPC or inside dungeon and say things were is things are not like this. Let's rewrite them, pure and simple. The dancer, uh, it's more you know a sort of combo combo player, mm -hmm. if I can say, it. Uh, because the the way the dancer. Um, Function is that you jump through time, a lot of time. You you are not quite interested in the cosmos or in the void. You you are more a, a sort of Zen class. So the the destiny will will unfold. The story will unfold itself. Mm -hmm. So what I can do or cannot do, it's only for my own purpose and my own utility. So a lot of power of the dancer mimics other classes. Because sometimes dancers do not uh, um, appear through time with their own identity. They take other form. So it's more like, you know, a sort of druid bath, not mm -hmm. with animals, but with peoples. You have a lot of um, features that 
mimics other classes for a short amount of time. You can uh, be seen as a paladin, as a, as a warrior, as a monk, uh, but really for a short amount of periods. These are called cool steps for the, the, the dancer. So you, it's like more a dancer in, uh, in a sort of uh, concrete way. It dances from a class to another. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it can be sometimes a ball, sometimes a wizard. And the, 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 the drawback is that the, the dancer can also, um, you know, lost themselves into, into other identities and never return themselves again. They can, they can be stuck into an identity for too long. So uh, this is quite the, the drawback, a drawback for the dancer. These, these are three different types of, you know, of gameplay. Mm -hmm. The first is more, I, I try to predict things. The, the second is more, I try to rewrite things. And the third is more, I, I dance between one, uh, the, between the, a passive stance and an active stance. Sometimes I foresee things, sometimes I define things. Mm -hmm. and I, but it's more focused on the, the character itself, on the, on the class itself. All right. Now, speaking of, speaking of character... Um, let's talk a bit about the Apocalypse, specifically the Apocalypse Clock, especially since within both the Quick Start and, within, and on the Kickstarter page, it's described as its own, char its own character. Um, and what I'm, cu what I'm curious about is how, th how this particular concept of a, of, of a moving Apocalypse came to, came to be. Uh, so, the, the 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 apocalypse is something that we 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 take from the first edition of Shinkiara. So, the apocalypse was was always in 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 the setting, but in the first edition was something more. You know, um, it, it was linked to extreme action made by the the main the the, the player character. So. If you if you used your your power, or if you used the paradoxes, so items from other ages, too much, there was this sort of break in the time, which is called time warp, and sometimes the time warp will activate events that will, you know, bring you closer to the apocalypse. But it was never a sort of counter. There, there was no clock. Uh, it was more like a sort of fictional way to, you know, to 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 freak players out and to to allow the player to really um, play strategically. In in this new, new system, this new setting, Shintaro Kuzeji's time, we thought about give the the the, the chronicler a more concrete way to uh, to establish. Where is the apocalypse, and when will hit the, the 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 character group? So there is. It came from 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 this sort of thinking. Mm -hmm. If we can give the the, the the chronicler a simple tool, so a clock, which sometimes um, with the same system. So there is also the time warp in Shintaro Zero time, which is a sort of. Um, uh, a sort of table inspired by the even table of uh, adventures in middle on middle earth uh from critical seven so it's mm -hmm. not more like a um you know a, an encounter table it's more like a sort of even table yeah and there is um a time work table defined on the on the on the chronicle guide but at the same time the chronicle can do the own version of the of the the time warp, sometimes the time warp will um, bring the apocalypse closer to you. But at the same time, since every time you go back in time, you create an altered reality in Shinjaro. It's more like mm -hmm. it's more or less like Avenger Endgame. Um, you can escape apocalypse, the apocalypse, but at the same time, your character and you as a player will know that another timeline 
as fall into the apocalypse. So mm -hmm. you can escape at the same time be, you know, be chased by the the regrets and the the horrifying horror, horrifying vision of the apocalypse. Um, this is the, the reason why we say that it's a character of its own because for for um from a recruit's perspective the apocalypse is sort of a living thing so you you flee from one time to another timeline to another timeline and it it seems like the apocalypse follows you you know like like a sort of uh, of a horror movie mm -hmm. and you, the the more you you battle you struggle in the crusade sign the more you think the apocalypse wants to eat every timeline of, of Shinkiara, but at the same time, the more you will face the apocalypse. So it's it's a paradox of its own. It's uh, it, it's quite a living a living element of the of the setting. Mm -hmm. Which uh, I I will ad I will admit that when I saw the w the way that the apocalypse is se is set up, one of the things that I was reminded of is um chrono trigger in the, in the sense that while you're tr while you're trying to prevent the de while you're trying to prevent the day of lavos in um in that game um the time period where it ended up happening that's sti that's still a f that's still a fixed point yeah you're so i am a i am a bit of a fan of chrono trigger mm -hmm. uh it's one of my favorite uh, league games. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's quite the reverse of Chrono Trigger because mm -hmm. uh, in Shinkara the only things that you cannot you know that are fixed in time and there's no quite a way to to remove them from from any timeline are um, the apocalypse and the higher entity which are the gods overseeing the magic. Um, maybe I will talk about a bit about them later. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in Chrono Trigger, there are some some events that are sort of uh, a pinpoint. Are sort of you know everything you will do, you will end in this sort of um, straight straight stream of events. Mm -hmm. uh, for Shinkari is the is 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 a bit the opposite. So. It, it's it's true in some way that for some recruits that's everything they do they will end up in you know uh, facing the apocalypse but at the same time there are a lot of recruits um, more about you know recruits from the void and from the dance that um, that live not in a single timeline so they they see time and they see their life not linked to a single timeline so they they cannot think like a, a chrono tiger character they do not believe in fate because they see only a flowing of events subjectively not and not objectively so it's more like you know crossing uh, crossing all dimension in uh, in another way uh, respect the events of the of the timeline so um there are some some characters more chrono guardians than than other other characters that may develop a, um, this type of mentality. So, whatever I will do, I will need to face the apocalypse. That is a fixed element. Mm -hmm. and so my struggle is to to uh, push the apocalypse as far as possible. But in the end, we will face it. And then there is a small percentage there are very small percentage of characters of any factions mm -hmm. that thinks that the apocalypse it's not a fixed event some chrono guardians thinks that they could push it push the apocalypse so far it will never happen and some um uh, character of the void thinks that the apocalypse can be brought in the early days of shinkara Till never will exist anymore. So, you know, this is a sort of spectrum of action, um, of different type of behavior um, against the, uh, the apocalypse itself. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is quite important for Shitari because every recruit has a vision when they begin their journey about the, the, the end 
and each vision of the apocalypse is different from each other and each recruits think that their vision is the only true it's the only true end mm -hmm. and now take now you can now um the current state with the with the project is Oh, is you and I do want to congratulate you guys on this. You were you were aiming for four thousand euro, and you're at sixteen and a half um, thousand at the time of this recording. Um, how now? I know you're. I know the plan is to split it into two books: the Recruits Guide and the Chroniclers um, Codex. Um, what are you looking at as far as page count for those two books? So we 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 started uh, with the, the idea to to have um, two books from two hundred to two hundred fifteen pages. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we are more or less about you know half in the middle, uh, 20, 30, 20, 130 pages mm -hmm. more or less. But I, I cannot be sure because. Uh, you know, during a Kickstarter, a lot of things happen. So there are a lot of fans that um, make a lot of questions, and uh, from those questions, you you sort of gather uh, new insight, and you you start developing new ideas. Like, oh, well, this this question uh, helps us, uh, you know, dealing with these elements. The system is quite written; mm -hmm. it's quite all written, but there is always uh, spaces from you know some pages to to clear the the, the, the player's mind. So we 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 are, we are aiming to to do a handbook um, that it's clear in in what is the the content. So uh, it may be a bit less than twenty uh, twenty hundred and fifty pages, a bit more. But at the at the end of it, we we are aiming to clarity um, most of all for the chronicle codex because as you you said before it's very difficult to uh, create adventure with side travel mm -hmm. and we have a system to to do this without have a sort of you know uh, madness inside your head uh, a dish of any sort and we want to you know to to have the space to to re to write the, 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 the rules as best as we can. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we do not want to be so... Um, so... To, to have a, an amount of information that is so huge, so big, that you cannot understand it. So um, I, pref I will prefer, personally, uh, to stay a bit less than uh, 20... Uh, 2050 pages but at the end it's the content that uh, will will guide us so if the content is very good is clear and is right so the the pages will will uh, will came after mm -hmm. i i can only second that let's say as a translator yep. um because sometimes what happens is as daniela says uh, the structure's already there, let's say, the skeleton. And then what you, you work for greater clarity. Um, sometimes from the feedback you have from the backers, from the people who, who actually, the players, who actually test the adventures themselves and the characters, they, they give you particular ideas. And from a translator's point of view, sometimes what happens is you are given deadlines, or sometimes not. And you already translated something to the best of your possibility. And then at the last second, the idea gets changed a little bit. And he says, okay, wait a minute. It's not going to be as simple as before or as complex as before. And you sort of weave that in to what is already an existing um, structure, which, con which is, consists of the base uh, of it. And so that's the interesting part. It's sort of flu very fluid, mm -hmm. but very solid at the same time. That in itself is a paradox. If, if I can add something about the, the, the page count, uh, 
it's it's a it's a silly silly thing it's a, it's a more of fun thing but it's very quite um, easier to write uh, um, something in English for me than in Italian because in Italian sometimes we have a lot of you know a lot of long phrases to to to, to convey a concept you need a lot of words. Mm -hmm. and very musical it's a very musical language but at the same time it's very very you know, <laughs> we have very long, long, you know, long <laughs> yeah and in english uh, instead we have very short words and uh, i'm i'm quite used to read and write in english i'm not quite used to talking in english so this is why my talking is Sounds like a bit uh, a bit weird, but I'm very, uh, you know, I I I read in English. I listen to movie and to series in English, and sometimes I find myself to write rules in English and to you know with a single phrase resolve a concept. And sometimes in, in, in Italian, mm -hmm. you need a whole paragraph to resolve the concept. So <laughs> this is. This is a, a bit of a, a fun addition to, to the problem of working on a project that is bilingual. But at the same time, I will write in Italian and the authors will write in Italian and Joe will help us with the, with the translator, translation because I am very, very good with the fifth edition, uh, the English of the fifth edition, but I, I need someone professional to uh, to help me on the on the bad job on the, mm -hmm. on the UG picture. Yeah, that makes words, sense. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. No, sorry, Mordor. Uh, I was about to say words are everything, and <laughs> I, um, ever since the first edition, I have been trying. Let's say we all have, but me personally, have been trying to give it a particular tone of language or using particular words instead of perhaps some usual words you could use, um, just to give it that uh, singularity or to make it a little more unique, um, not only uh, in reference to time traveling and the veils and paradoxes, but to give it that sort of um, elevation and stature, which I believe it deserves. Yeah. And I... Um... I've seen my I've seen my fair share of interesting experiences when it comes to um tr when it comes to translate when it comes to translation um in par in part beca in part due to being a being a fan of certain certain stories that aren't in my native language like the me like the Metro series of books which <laughs> people have people have to translate Russian into English have to double as um authors in and of themselves and there and um when Andy Kitkowski still had his blog regarding the develop the development of the translation of Tenra, um, he had he had a few stories about how his um, editor would come would come back with certain parts and say, "Yeah, we yeah we need to redo this." Like what? Just a couple sentences? No, all of it. <laughs> and, th and then you and then you could probably see <laughs> Andy's temperature rise about seven degrees over that. Um, like and. I w it's one it's one of those things where de where and obviously some languages are are going to have an easier time than others but I do feel that when it comes to tran when it comes to translation it's equal parts being an author it's an author in and of itself as much as it is just translating what's there um yeah uh, it's it's uh, in, in Italian I um... I did some work of translation from mm -hmm. English to, to Italian. Mm -hmm. I translated the dialect, I translated the Blades in the Dark. Mm -hmm. um, so I work as a translator in Italy on, on huge projects. And I discovered myself that um, what my, my translation teacher in, in the university said, translation is always a treason, an act of treason, because you cannot translate everything as, as the same with the same nuance, with the same um, meaning from a language to another. Most of the time when it comes to idioms, so 
uh, expression you cannot you, you do not do not have mm -hmm. the same uh, meaning so sometimes you need to be creative with the, with the translation itself to to help the the reader understand what was the the the, the aim in the original text uh, and at the same time you you're perfectly you, you know that you are doing something wrong on the on the literary level so the translation is not quite um words per words but is more like you know the meaning of the phrase the meaning of the of, of the words especially with idioms especially in idioms so it's true. It's it, sometimes you need to be creative, and so it's more like you know, fifty percent you you are translating things, fifty percent you are not translating. You are sort of problem solving the translation. So you you're constantly trying to find the right word to to translate something. And there are especially for me some difficult things. To translate from English to Italian, which are uh, resemantization. So when you use, and it's quite common in English, and I like it very well, but in Italian it's quite difficult to have. When you use a verb as an adjective or an adjective as a verb, and it's so beautiful in English, but at the same time, it's quite difficult to, to, to you know, to translate in Italian because we, we are not quite used to, to that type of, uh, the type of, um, structure. So, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. It's 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 always a bit you know a bit translation, a bit the an author of the of the text. I completely agree. I would only add, let's say, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, as you said, you become a sort of co-author yourself because part of the uh, the preliminary work is guesswork and you yourself say or you think okay by this phrase by this sentence what is the author really trying to say mm -hmm. and you have to sort of try to do a bit of mind reading uh, for the author and obviously you can't call them up every second um, you sort of do the best you can and then hope that the the minute that the author sees or sort of proofreads in a way what you have translated is going to be either received as okay or um, have acknowledgement that your interpretation of their writing was correct. Um, if not, you know, start all over again, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, but th that's part of the fun. I believe. Um, you can't, um, as Daniela was saying, translate word for word. That would create nonsense and transliteration mm -hmm. goes nowhere. Um, but that is really part of the fun and part of considering yourself as an author too. Um, mm -hmm. Because it is putting yourself into it um, in the end. But it doesn't matter whether your translation is going to be accepted or not because as a translator, you can only offer alternatives. Mm -hmm. Apart from, obviously, everyone has their favorite alternative. So obviously, I come up with a particular word or a particular sentence, mm -hmm. and let's say the uh, let's say the the editors and the authors say, "Oh no, I really don't like this." Are you sure? Because there may be some pitfalls, there's some words. Um, just to give you an example, maybe your typical false friends, in which they mean the complete opposite in Italian, and um, using our language, and they say, "Oh no, this sounds really bad." Does it really mean that? And I say, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. and say, okay, and I'm not sure whether if Italians that read the English version are going to fully understand that this word is does mean that particular word in Italian and they're not going to misunderstand it and misinterpret it. And that's, you know, that does give you a headache sometimes, um, but it is just part of the job and the fun, I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, given given all of that, um, I know I know that there is the whole estimated delivery thing on the page itself. But what do you sh what are you shooting for when it comes to a release window? Are you a are you aiming for fall of this year, or do 
at, with the digital version, or do you think that's going to be heading in a little bit sooner? So uh, the the reason why I will say uh, th this is due most of all on COVID situation. So mm -hmm. in in a in a standard year, we will head to November, October, November delivery because in in late October even here in Italy there is a sort of the most important convention of all like a sort of Comic Con for Italians which is Luca Comics. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of important uh, you know um, people from from all over the world. It's more like a comic uh, convention but there is a, a lot of um, tabletop RPG fans and th there is a huge um, space inside uh, Luca Comics uh, only for tabletop games, which is you know growing um, bigger and bigger each each year. But at the same time, this year we 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 do not know when we can do convention again. Mm -hmm. What will it will be like? So our window is for now. Uh, as for today, to have the digital edition for the fall, and then uh, I think the authors and, um, and all the people around the project will understand how to work with the the, um, the shipping of the the physical editions. Mm -hmm. But I'm quite frankly, uh, you know, sure that the digital release could be also, you know, we have the adventures of have to separate mm -hmm. um, books so we can also do if we if we had the chance a sort of uh, two-step delivery so mm -hmm. we can deliver the the first book the recruiter's guide and then the, cro the chronicle codex uh, in a second time this is up to to uh, first of all how will we we will end the the kickstarter the, the, that is the the, the the main important things. The second thing is COVID, of course, and the third thing is, you know, is what the authors will will um, will uh, decide. Because I I think that the, the most important thing is to deliver the best product possible in in the right date, in the right period of time. But uh, I'm not the I am a super baker on Kickstarter, and there are a lot of projects that I still need to receive. And even if I, I sometimes be, I sometimes uh, find myself a bit angry over the the most expected Kickstarter. I totally understand when um, a designer or um, you know a publisher says to the fan, we need to to deliver some some month after the expected deadline, but this is to ensure you the best quality the best game possible ever of course you you don't have you you, you don't have to linger on this thing to you know to uh, decide these things ahead but the, the, the deadline is for 2021 but mm -hmm. at the same time we want to deliver the best possible product ever and um I will cer I will certainly be look I certainly appreciate that dedication to quality and I will be looking forward to ha to um how the whole how the whole thing sh shakes out when the time comes um especially especially since um I'm pretty I'm pretty sure if I end up running Shintiara I get the feeling my pl my players will be trying to t trying to talk me into into putting um into putting a few putting a few power metal tracks in my in my playlist as a GM, um, and I can I can already th I can already think of a f I can already think of a few that I'd be that I'd be doing anyways just because I feel like it. Um, this I can probably find instrumental versions of some of Luca Torelli's work. <laughs> um, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedules and braving the hell of time zones to come to come all the way up to the temple. And thank you for the opportunity. Anytime it's been mm -hmm. great being in the temple. Anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, 
Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. We um, will drink to that. Yep. And a full chalice is not too. <laughs> yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.